Okay, boys and girls, today we're talking about secrets they don't tell you about backpacking gear and kind of just tips and tricks you pick up along the way. So without any further ado, let's jump right into this. Okay, so for these first two, the first one is going to be tent sizes. And this one seems a little bit more basic, or if you end up spending time around tents, you'll fastly find out that tents might be rated for one or two or three people or even more sometimes. But generally, when they give you that estimation of, let's say, a two-person tent, they mean that you can put two physical human bodies in that tent. And it's a hard uh, kind of job accounting for sleeping pads, sleeping bags, and any other additional equipment that you might need to bring with you. And so it's really important when you're considering, you know, what type of or what size of tent that you should get, try to size up at least by one person more than you're expecting. So if you're expecting to have two people, I would say, you know, over a duration of time, like if you're going to be going out and camping or backpacking for any duration of time, you know, having a three-person tent for two people is going to be a lot better than carrying a two-person for two people because two people can sleep in a two-person tent, but doing it day after day is definitely going to be a challenge and it's not going to be the most functional. And sometimes with different tents, you have to sleep at odd angles and it's just not always the most functional thing. So it can work in a pinch, but I would generally recommend sizing up. Uh, and that does include even with one person tents, you know, if you know you're bringing a lot of gear. What I try to do is carry something not quite like a two person tent, but something like a 1.75 or 1.5 person tent. And they do exist, they're a little bit harder to find, but if you are rolling by yourself a lot, you will heavily appreciate yourself for going with something like a one and a half or a one and three quarter person tent, because I'm here to tell you an actual one person tent they mean you can fit one body in there and a sleeping bag and a sleeping mat and that's about it. You know, you, there's really no space for any extra gear and uh, yeah. So definitely try to size up. The next tip for this one is going to be hammocks are not for amateurs. And what I mean by this is that I like hammocks. I run a hammock setup and I have certainly hammock camped in the past. But hammocks are not for amateurs. Definitely what I would say is make sure that you practice with whatever kit you're going to go with before you go out and backpack with that hammock setup. Not only because you want to get the angles and the tension right for the hammock, but there's a lot of components to it. There's things like your asymmetrical tarp that you want to have over you, potentially a bug net that you want to have depending if you are going into a very buggy environment. There's a under or top quilt that you want to have and even potentially maybe a sleeping mat depending on the type of hammock you're running. Once again, there's many different types of hammocks out there and depending on the environment and setup you're running, you just want to make sure that even if you just go into your backyard, hang it, your hammock up against a couple trees or up between a couple trees, make sure that you practice with your system because with a tent, it's very straightforward. You set up the poles, you set up the tent, and there's your, um, there's your setup. But with a hammock, like I said, you have your hammock, it needs to be tensioned correctly, you have your ASIM tarp, you have your bug net, your under quilt, and several different components that you need to make sure that you know how to use effectively before you go out. So hammocks, hammock camping can be really cool, but it's definitely not for amateurs. So another one that I kind of picked up along the way is that women's sleeping bags are warmer. And this means that generally women's sleeping bags are accommodating for the biological differences between male and female. And generally females need a little bit warmer sleeping environment or generally they don't produce as much body heat. So sleeping bags for women are generally warmer. And while not every person or every guy can fit in a sleeping bag designed for women, uh, if you do have or if you are a smaller size, you might be able to actually run a, um, you might be able to actually make a less warm sleeping bag or a less warm rated sleeping bag work for you in different environments because women's sleeping bags have a greater fill to them. So unfortunately this one doesn't really apply to me because I'm 6'2", so there's not many sleeping bags for women that I would actually fit in effectively, but um, if you are, you know, around 5'10", to you know five five you might actually be able to fit in some larger or taller 
uh, women's sleeping bags pretty effectively and those being a warmer fill or having more fill in them can get you down to colder temperatures with greater ease and actually maybe save you a few dollars. So quick tip, once again, I would always recommend testing it. Don't go blindly, but generally women's uh, sleeping bags are warmer. So the next one for me, and definitely I've learned this one the hard way, is that gear breaks and be prepared. So what I mean by this is whether it's your tent, your backpack, whatever, you know, things break, things rip, tear, you know, having, especially if you're going to be out for, you know, multiple days, having a small amount of duct tape, having some cord to sew with, having a needle to sew with, uh, you know, simple, small, light things that you can carry to help repair your gear or potentially fix it can mean a lot, especially like with a tent. Uh, one time I had a tent uh, pole just break due to sheer amount of wind, and that uh, that tent was out, you know, without that pole, um, that tent was basically useless. So being able to have gear and be able to repair that gear when it breaks and just knowing that your gear will break and being able to take the proper steps to fix it when it does is a big thing, especially if you are, you know, say you're taking a four day trip, you know, nothing too crazy and you're two days into your four day trip and something breaks, you know, you still got another two days to go. And more than likely, if you know, you're hiking out two days and then back two days, you know, you're at the furthest point out. So if your equipment breaks there, you need to be able to fix it or else you're kind of screwed. So making sure that you know that your gear is going to break at some point and having the ability to fix it when it does is super important and learning from my personal experiences, I would heavily recommend this fact. So the next one for me is trail food simplified. Now a lot of backpackers use things like mountain house meals, peak refuel, uh, and several other kind of ready to go or MRE styled meals, or some people even use just regular military MREs. But I will tell you guys that those are certainly good and effective. But another thing that I've been running a lot and actually in my bushcrafting is where it really started was carrying just bags of dried grains, dried uh, kind of dried dried grains, dried legumes, dried pastas that you can cook reasonably easily and readily in the field. And in addition to this, carrying small things of spices to kind of spice the food up. And not only is this a super effective way to carry food in, uh, it's also a very cheap way to carry food in. So, you know, you can go to your local grocery store and get pounds of, let's just say, couscous, and it will cost you, you know, maybe $2 a pound for couscous. And you can get a couple pounds, and that will last you several meals. And, you know, you can also get a couple pounds of oats. That will last you another few meals there. And so not only is it much cheaper than something like, you know, a peak refuel, it's also much better tasting. I mean, oftentimes I'll run like just real oats and some actual uh, brown sugar. And I'm here to tell you, like, I've had peak refuel uh, instant oatmeal versus my oatmeal that I've made. And the peak refuel oatmeal taste like mush. Like they, they're, they look disgusting. They don't taste that great. But the the humble oatmeal that I make, uh, you know, with my real oats that I got from the grocery store, not only do they taste better, but they also look like real food. And so, I don't know, They a lot of the MRE kind of style meals are like, they look like flavored cardboard, and there's nothing against them per se, but I just really don't like paying $10 a meal or $8 a meal to have this food that's subpar to begin with. And uh, yeah, it's just a lot better to carry bagged, you know, grains, legumes, pastas, and cook them up in the field. You know, you're going to be using the same amount of water, the same type of heat to cook the food anyways, so you might as well get food that at least tastes good. You know, you can spice it to the way you want it to taste, or you can make it taste the way you want it, and uh, it's just a better way, and like I said, I think it's a little bit more simple, lighter, cheaper. The next one for me, and this one isn't a carte blanche statement across the board, uh, I've, obviously I do realize vintage gear gets replaced for a reason, but vintage gear is oftentimes great. And this is something that, like, I run my Boy Scouts of America mess kit a lot, and it's because, I actually have several of them, 
but they are super inexpensive, super functional, and pretty lightweight. And so, while I'm not going to say every piece of vintage gear is better than the modern counterpart, because obviously technology does increase, but I will say there are some vintage pieces of gear that especially if you can get them, like I've gotten some of my Boy Scouts of America mess kits for like 15 to $10. And so, you know, if I was to try to get a modern replacement or a modern type of version to replace that mess kit, it would be easily 50 bucks. And so you can save a lot of money by getting vintage pieces of kit and vintage pieces of gear that, you know, honestly work just as well as the modern stuff. They're just lesser known. And once again, you know, they might be, they might have some miles on them, but you know, it's, it's not really going to affect you. It's good gear and, you know, stuff like snowshoes. I use vintage snowshoes a lot and my tubs, Aurora 25s or 26s, they work just fine for treading snow. Like I have no issues and they're every bit as good as modern snowshoes. Um, you know, so I would heavily recommend, you know, going on places like eBay or Etsy or even sometimes Amazon. You can find vintage and used gear and try to get stuff like that. Once again, you know, not every piece of old gear is good, but a lot of it is actually better than you might think. So I heavily recommend checking vintage. So the last one for me is less is more. And this is really going back to how much gear you're planning to carry. And unfortunately with this philosophy, I recommend doing shorter trips to kind of figure out what you really need, what you really want before, you know, going on crazy long trips just to avoid carrying a lot of gear. But you do have to ultimately experiment with gear, figure out what types of equipment you need to carry, you know, what you can't live without, what you can live without, what you would like to have, you know, and kind of just basing that off of your personal experiences. Unfortunately, there's no way for me to just say, you know, this is what I carry, so this is what you should carry. You know, everyone's different. Once again, some people might find they need a warmer sleeping bag. Some people might find they need, uh, you know, a lighter sleeping bag because they per they produce more body heat or their body retains heat better. Um, so, you know, this is a something that you have to factor yourself, you know, in each experience or everyone's going to be different. But I would say, you know, really practice with some of the gear before going out, you know, on super long treks to find out what you're really going to use, what you're really going to need, and uh, try to build a light system with that in mind. So these have been some of the, so this has been some of my experiences with things that they don't tell you about backpacking gear. And this can also translate to camping as well. Uh, there is a lot of crossovers between backpacking and camping, but hopefully you guys have enjoyed this video. Hopefully it's been educational and useful. And as always, guys, God bless, and I'm out.